Today, I want to talk to you about the project finance model from the lender's perspective. Hi, if you don't know me, my name is Hedie. I made financial modeling to be my profession as well as my passion. So if you're interested, please subscribe. In today's session, I want to talk to you about uh, what the lenders would uh, look for in a financial model, specifically in a project finance mo financial model. Uh, so first of all, most of the time when the uh, lenders are reviewing the project documents during the due diligence, one of the most important project documents is the financial model that most of the time they receive it from the sponsor. So they receive a first version of the model from the sponsor that um, they need to review it and see whether they want to adopt it or they want to build a new model from scratch. Uh, on the other hand, sponsors, they are the one who build the financial model. First of all, they build it from their own perspective and they have a version that they call a sponsor version. It's an internal version. It might, um, it might contain a lot of details of cost, the details of um, shareholder calculation, return calculation. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are hiding or they are deleting things when they are sending it to the lender. It's just like some, some information is not necessary for the lenders to know, like the sharing of economics between the shareholders and different kind of things. So there is another version of the model that is that is going to be sent from the sponsor to the lenders and when the lenders receive that model the first thing they need to do as I said is to review that version of the model and to understand whether they want to adopt it and make it their own or if they want to build it from scratch and, and these are the time that's going to be very difficult to have two versions of the model to kind of, um, you know, to have the two version of the model at the same time, one from the sponsor side, one from the lender side. It's going to cost a lot in terms of the audit if the sponsors want to also audit it from their end. So that's an additional cost. So the best way to do it is to have a one version of the model for both lenders and sponsors that uh, I will make another video discussing how you can easily um, convert a sponsor model to a lender's model and the differences between the two of them. Now in this uh, video we are just talking about the things that the lenders will most probably pay attention to and look for in a project finance model. So this is the first step is to do a review of a financial model. I recently did a webinar with Daniel from Plum Solutions and uh, I'm going to put the link down below. You can also watch it. We went through the uh, first the checklist, basically the project financial model checklist that I have on Eloquence. You can also download that. I will put the link below. And so uh, we went through that. And, and if you are interested, you can have a look at that video. Um, the, the, the things that you do in this first step is to go through the sponsor model and the first thing in order to decide whether you want to keep that model or you just want to build it from scratch is to do a mechanical check of the model to see that whether the model is flexible enough, is transparent enough so that you can keep it throughout your due diligence. So that's the important thing to have to have a model that is flexible and that is transparent. And these are the things that we call standards in financial modeling. It's nothing but you know having color codes, having a structured spreadsheet, having input separated from calculation sheets, and these different standards that are well known in the market right now. Um, so. Um, after you decide, after you've done a review of a financial model, based on my experience, usually models fall into four categories. One category, which I call them, it's a trash, excuse my language, is trash category. This is a model that is, has no standard, has no structure, it's just like a mess. And I always tell people that, you know, when you're sending uh, documents to a third party, to lenders, who, to the government, you know, if it's a PDF file, you always make sure that it is beautifully designed. You know, you have a table of content, you have headings, everything is perfect. However, when it comes to Excel and the financial model, we see some disasters. You know, we see people that they don't have any kind of formatting, no color codes. So it's all over and it's a messy, hard coded figures within formulas. So these are the things that, you know, it's not acceptable 
And so if you see such a thing, you just, you know, from the beginning, it's better to just say that we cannot deal with this. We need a model that is based on the best practice modeling standards. So those ones, those the trash ones that you just kill them from the beginning. Then there are some models that I call overly simplified. And um, I always say that, you know, it's a very delicate thing between simplicity and, um, you know, complexity. If you want to put a label of simple or complex on a project model, you just have to make sure that you know the story of the project. At which stage are we in this project? Or maybe it's justifiable to have a simple model at that stage because you don't have many kind of lenders or one tranche of debt is enough or you don't have many kind of the cost breakdown so you just have one cost there for your capex for your opex so maybe it's you can justify it but it's always better to have like for example the cost it's always better to have some spares in case that you want to add some additional items as you progress with the um, with the due diligence of the project so however if a model is overly simplified for example in a project finance model or in any in a corporate model as well if um, most probably you want your projections to be on quarterly basis or on semi-annual basis because our, the debts are mostly paid on periodic basis on quarterly or on semi-annual basis so having a model that is on annual basis throughout might be a oversimplification so if the model is on annual basis and you don't have the flexibility to also change that that might be a signal that you would say that maybe it's better to rebuild the model from scratch because it doesn't allow us to see that the periodic um, the periodic um, kind of um, the periodic projections excuse me because my uh, my keyboard I say something wrong my my keyboard is scrolling down automatically so I have uh, some issues there it's just some mechanical issues hopefully um, so yes so this is a the overly simplified model and some of the models they're a black box meaning that you know you cannot work with it it's like there are macros which are password protected there are sheets that are password protected you cannot have access to them it's overly complex it takes like five minutes to run you know all the macros in a model so that's something that you cannot work with it from the beginning even if it is beautifully made there are beautiful color codes and everything if it is complex meaning that it's difficult to maintain the model again you have to be careful about what you call complex however if that's the case then that black box is something that you don't want to work with it and it's better to just say from the beginning that um, uh, you, you want to just rebuild it from scratch and if you cannot recover the password that's what you need to say okay uh, then the next thing is um, the standard model so that's when you hit the jackpot that's if you have if you receive a, um, a kind of like a standard model everything is in, in a good shape you have color code it's structured inputs are separated from output then that's perfect you say okay we will adopt the model this doesn't mean that you're going to take everything as given you would say that okay that's a good base and we can build things up in this model if they don't have sensitivities built in it's okay you can build sensitivities additional sensitivities into the model so if that's the case then you say all right as we explained here we say okay to the model you ask you send them an email to the sponsor saying that congratulate them on the model that they have built a model that you can use going forward and you just gonna you might ask them for a couple of modifications you know to bring it to your standards but eventually you accept it as your base case as your financial model however that's the first step so that's the first step is the mechanical check the second step which is the most important one is to go through the um is to go through the um, assumptions you know so that's the main thing is to understand every single um, inputs that goes into the model find out the reference for it where did they come from is it realistic the timeline is realistic so it's all about verification 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 at this stage 
And um, so in order to do that as a financial modeler, you need to have access to all the project documents. You see the lawyers, they might just need to have access to the contracts, the technical advisors, they might only need to have access to the technical details to go to the site and see the project. However, as a financial modeler, you need to have the technical, the legal, the fiscal, all the reports you have to have access, environmental, everything you need to have access. You need to go through them one by one carefully to understand the story of the project because this financial model will contain all of the contracts, all of the agreements. They have a one part for technical, one part for financial, but the CAPEX side, the O&M, so the contractor, the EPC contractor, the O&M contractor, all of them you need to know what's the dynamic, what's at which stage you are, the project um, is in terms of the EPC negotiation, uh, all the contract negotiation, and with the financiers, with the other financiers, sponsors, how many sponsors are engaged, how many lenders are engaged. So all of that you need to have access to the documents and you need to understand and make sure that the financial model reflects all the uh, inputs or the basically the reality of the project at the time and has the flexibility to kind of make changes because as we know projects they are like us human beings things changes so the model needs to also be flexible enough to reflect these changes and to be able to accommodate uh, future changes okay so that's about going through the assumptions then the next step is to do the ratio calculations that the lenders are um, interested in. So we are not going to go through all of them, but for example, one of the main important ratios that the lenders look for is the DSCR, debt service cover ratio. So that's one of the main ratios that you know all lenders they calculate, and it will tell them the debt payment capacity of the project, right? So that's an important ratio. And it is calculated, the formula for it is just basically CFADS, which is cash flow after debt service. And it is, uh, you can see that in the cash flow waterfall, we will look at it in the in the next slide. So you take the CFADS, uh, CFADS from the cash flow waterfall and you divide it by interest and principal in each period. All right. So that's why we said it's important to have a periodic model because you need to calculate it in each period. And um, if you're paying, if the debt based on the term sheet, the debt needs to repay on semi-annual basis. So you need to calculate these ratios on semi-annual basis. If it is on quarterly, on quarterly basis. So depending on how you pay, uh, repay the debt, that's basically what's going to um, determine uh, what should be the periodicity of the model. Okay. So you do that and I'm going to show you in the next slide the cash flow waterfall, a typical project finance uh, waterfall, cash flow waterfall. You see that, you know, this is exactly who gets what and when. That's that's basically what the cash flow waterfall tells. And there are a lot of discussions during the term sheet negotiation about the um, uh, basically the position of each cash flow in this cash flow waterfall. For example, whether you know this item, this cost item should be before or after debt service, May, whether their maintenance reserve account should be before or after debt service. So these are all the negotiations that you know the lenders will have with the sponsor to make sure that they have a cash flow waterfall that basically um, basically kind of minimizes their risk, you know? So basically, because the main revenues, the main security of any project finance um, in a project finance deal are the revenues. There is nothing else, you know, there, is, there are no other collaterals that the lenders can go and claim. So they need to make sure that these revenues who gets what? The first thing is the OPEX, the operating, is to, the revenues needs to go for the operating expenses. The O&M contractor, the labor, all of them needs to get paid so that the project is operational. So they are, these are the first layers. Then most probably is the taxes, right? So you need to pay your taxes. After you paid your operating expenses, then you have to also pay your taxes. So they come next. And after that, most probably if there are any uh, maintenance or anything that is required, you also include that before that service. And after that, whatever remains from these uh, operational cash flow, you go, you're going to pay it for the debt service, interest and principal of the debt. So that's basically what this um, CFA, um, this um, debt service cover ratio 
um, calculates, right? And it's coming from the cash flow waterfall. That's why it is important for any project finance model. I would even go further and say for even even corporate models to have this cash flow waterfall because it it tells you the um, superiority of each cash flow statement. All right, so after you've done uh, all the calculations, so there are also some other ratios like LLCR, there is that PLCR project, you know, um, ratio. So all of this, I have actually a template, but I'm gonna put the link down below that I explained there and I do a kind of calculation of all of these ratios, okay? Um, the other thing that is important is to have multiple principal repayment methods included in a project finance model, right? So you need to have this flexibility. You know, at the beginning, when you start negotiating the contracts with the sponsor, you want to have the flexibility to see what if the debt is paid on straight line basis. Straight line meaning that the principal is paid on the, the same amount of principal is paid on each period. The other one is annuity. Annuity is a constant, meaning that equal interest and principal is paid um, in each payment period. The other one is sculpted, you know, so it's kind of like customized one that you can play with it. That's, that's it's, I would really recommend for any model to have this kind of flexibility so that you can come up with a sculpted um, profile. And then the, another one is a mechanical one, um, automatic one that you can also build in, in any project model is to have uh, the, uh, the to kind of find out the repayment profile based on the target DSCR. So these are the four methods that I would recommend uh, to be built in all the project models so that you can test them and see what is best suited for the cash flow of any project. All right, the next thing that any uh, lenders would, would like to have in a financial model is the sensitivity and scenario analysis, all right? Because any kind of project documents, when lenders go to their boards or any kind of, like, even sponsors, when they go to their investment committees, they always ask for sensitivity analysis because, as we said, we live in an uncertain world, so things might change. So they want to see typical uh, kind of sensitivities or CapEx, OPEX, up and down, what's going to be the impact on the debt service cover ratios, what's going to be the impact on the uh, sponsor IRR. So what's, so all of these are the things that you um, the model needs to find out, you know, it needs to have the flexibility to change the main parameters and see the impact on the main project um, parameters and metrics. All right, I think I covered everything. Sorry for this uh, problem with my uh, uh, uh powerpoint but um so i'm make sure that you check the links that i'm going to put down below and uh, let me know if you're interested um, in a video on uh, sponsor and lenders financial model and how to navigate in between the two of them all right okay thank you and see you next time